I'm going to talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease, and, um, and I'll tell you why I developed an, an interest in this, first of all. Well, let me tell you what it is. Let's, let's define it first. It refers to bowel disorders. The most common ones that you hear about are Crohn's and colitis. Um, the most common symptom is infl inflammation that develops throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Um, it approximately affects 1.4 million people in the United States, costs $1.7 billion a year, and um, accounts for a lot of disability, doctor visits, surgeries, etc. The two major types are Crohn's disease, with Crohn's disease, the inflammation can develop anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract from the mouth all the way through the body down to the lower intestine and uh, rectum. Uh, ulcerative colitis affects the inner lining of the lower uh, intestine. The symptoms are very similar for both. Uh, pain, bloody, mucus-filled stools, um, diarrhea, uh, it's not unusual to see these patients even medicated, having 20 bloody bowel movements a day. They generally live uh, having to know where the nearest restroom is, which restricts your activity a lot because, for example, if you want to go out hiking in the woods, um, that can be difficult, or canoeing, a lot of activities. A lot of the people that uh, uh, have come to our office for help have given up a lot of the things that they really like to do because of horseback riding, you don't get to do anything like that because the first thing you do is you get into a new place, you find out where the bathrooms are, and make sure you sit at the back of the theater so you can run out there 14 times during the movie. This is the way these people live. Um, both conditions usually run in cycles. They start out relapsing and remitting. At some point in time, um, they get worse. They, with age, particularly, they get worse. And as you run through the repertoire of medications, um, eventually nothing works. And if you go to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's website, they don't say it exactly this way, but I'll give you my interpretation of it. If you have colitis, you're really lucky because you can get cured by taking out your colon. What a lucky thing that is. If only these people knew how lucky they were. Apparently, they just don't understand their good fortune when they're having the colon taken out. I mean, come on. Whereas colitis, you can't take out the whole de uh, gastrointestinal tract, so you're going to end up with symptoms no matter what you do. So how I got interested in this, uh, and you can see the complications here. They're, they're miserable, uh, absolutely miserable. These patients have no quality of life by the time this, finish, this is finished. So how I got interested in this is that um, uh, a woman came to me about 16 years ago. She'd done some contract work for our company, and she had Crohn's disease. She said, you don't know this about me, but I've had Crohn's for 20 years. I spend six or seven weeks a year in the hospital. Um, right now, so I'm taking Remicade, and uh, I have a lump in my breast, I have a spot on my lung and an abnormal pap test, and I don't know if the Crohn's is gonna kill me or the Remicade's gonna kill me, that's what she was taking. But I have to do something, because I certainly can't go on this way. I said, well, I didn't learn much about Crohn's and colitis. I mean, I learned about what it was in school, but certainly not anything that would change your life. But let me start doing some research. And this was the first, my first venture into doing my own research. Let's see what's out there. I mean, maybe there is nothing out there, but maybe there is something. And so I started doing research, and over the last 16 years, I've archived 2,000 studies on my server showing that the connection between diet and Crohn's and colitis. And I'll come back to my a uh, person who contacted me back then. So um, let's talk about causes. The incidence of Crohn's disease is higher in urban areas than rural areas. Why is that? The diets are different there. Patients with Crohn's disease eat more sugar, refined carbohydrates, more omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in polyunsaturated oils and animal foods, um, less fruit and vegetables. They improve on exclusion and elemental diets, and then they get worse when they go off those diets. Elemental diet is basically <clears throat> uh, vitamin fortified water. And I started looking at that thinking, is it vitamin fortified water that's making them better? Is it, or is it what they're not eating during that period of time? That became a very important clue. Dietary causes, diet and lifestyle are the likely causes when people move from an area of low IBD incidence to an area of high IBD incidence, you see an increase in risk. Diet high in meats and fatty foods, desserts has been associated with a higher incidence of Crohn's disease in children. 
Refined foods increases the risk of Crohn's and UC. Um, and, and so you know, look at the number of studies. I, I'm just giving you a smattering here, but you notice I'm pretty careful to put research on my slides. And, and I think that as you, as you start to become more discerning consumers of health information, when people just show you, st like we were talking last night, making up stories, you know, um, this isn't about some, I'm gonna tell you the story of what happened to this woman in a minute here, but, but the background on the situation isn't the story, it's the science that backs up the mechanism for the story that I'm gonna share with you, and that's very important. High intake of meat, protein, uh, sulfur, where do you find the sulfur? It's in the animal foods. Alcohol intake cause relapse for UC patients. Animal foods, particularly dairy products and, a and eggs, are high in sulfur, and they aggravate the lining of the intestine, leading to increased risk of disease. Crohn's is more prominent in areas, or more prevalent in areas of the world where dairy intake is higher. When dairy is removed from the diet of UC patients, they get better. When it's reintroduced, every single patient gets, uh, suffers relapse. In one study, an analysis of this study estimated that based on the average relapse rates, it's ra uh, relapse rates for Crohn's patients, the odds that these relapse, uh, relapses in response to bringing milk back into the diet uh, were, were chance were greater than a thousand to one, okay? It was clearly the, the milk. You feed them milk, they get worse, you take it away, and they get better. So do you see, we don't have Esselstyn data, but are we starting to get a picture of what these people should not eat? Yeah, I think so. One study concluded that ulcerative colitis patients might actually have an allergy to milk. Um, and researchers reported a highly significant association between uh, circulating antibodies to cow's milk, similar to what we see in the type 1 diabetics that we were talking about earlier. Um, a study review of 19 studies, 2,500 patients with IBD, and you see the same story. Animal foods, fat, dairy, increased risk, not as many vegetables, fruits, whole foods. Uh, increased risk. The study in Japan looked at the relationship between dietary changes and Crohn's and colitis, and what they found is increased uh, intake of total fat, animal fat, polyunsaturated fat. You know, everybody has this idea that there are better fats. I'll tell you, there's only one thing, it's called low fat, that is protective. The strongest independent dietary factor, however, was animal protein. So much for eating lower fat animal foods. Second most important factor was polyunsaturated fat. Worse than saturated fat. Patients who eat less fiber, less raw fruits and vegetables, and more refined sugar have an increased risk of Crohn's disease. A study of Canadian children, same thing. Poor diet leads to increased risk. Um, and you see the same thing again and again and again. The gut microbiome. Very interesting um, uh, new field of study. I mean, 90% of the articles on the gut microbiome in the medical journals were written in the last uh, 20 years or so, 25 years. Um, what happens is diet affects the gut microbiome. When you eat a diet high in animal foods, dairy products, low in fiber, high in fat, and then you get all the diseases associated with doing that, starting in childhood where you're taking a lot of antibiotics for sinus infections and ear infections and that sort of thing. You destroy your gut microbiome. And that's a risk factor for developing um, uh, UC and Crohn's. So I'm showing you a smattering, but anyway, a clear picture was starting to emerge. And so I said to this woman, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but enough to start experimenting with you. And so the goals were, when we started this, to reduce inflammation, heal the damaged tissue, restore the gut microbiome, and reduce or eliminate medications. And so um, what happened with her, and then I'll tell you how we did it, uh, is we started experimenting with ideas, and within a few months, she had a great gastroenterologist, by the way, who said, listen, you're not getting better, you're getting worse and I'm interested in trying anything that would help you. So he took her off her meds and said, let's see what happens. That was 16 years ago, and she is still a former Crohn's patient, okay? In fact, our, uh, our members have fun with that. You know, they'll say, I used to have Crohn's, I used to have colitis, and people say, what do you mean you used to have it? Well, I don't have it anymore. I mean, you get rid of it, right? 
All right, so, so anyway, that's what we did, and she's, she's maintained um, her uh, state of remission for 16 years from the point that we started, remember, on Remicade, not working, lump in the breast, abnormal pap test, and spot on her lung, all right? And by the way, she's like the healthiest person you know. She's another one whose IQ is higher than her cholesterol. So um, what, what you want next is you want the universe to send you lots of people who have this condition so you can refine your protocol, which is what happened, actually. Um, the one thing you'll learn about me over time, I am the luckiest human you will ever meet on the planet, really, truly. Uh, and some people, when they come to work at, at Wellness from Health, some of the staff will tell them, you never saw anything like what happens to Pam Popper, because when she puts something out there, it always happens. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, right, right. And usually about six months later, they'll come in and they'll go, you really are like the luckiest person I know. So anyway, we got a lot of people who decided to contact us and we got a chance to practice the protocol. And so here's the thing that we do. You know, I mentioned earlier that I didn't think fortified vitamin water was really helping the patients as much as what they were taking out of the diet. So I thought, well, what if we fed people who have IBD a plant-based diet and we chose really low protein, low fat foods that very seldom cause reactions in anybody? Um, and one of the things that we wanted to include was brown rice because it's known to clean up diarrhea, which all these patients have. So we started feeding them potatoes, brown rice, and um, they can only have four vegetables, green peas, carrots, celery, and green beans, and they have to be cooked so that they melt in your mouth, all right? So if the green beans don't dissolve on your tongue, they're not well cooked enough. This is the opposite of the advice you give to other people. Um, Wild-caught salmon or organic animal food a couple times a week, and sometimes that surprises people. But one thing you have to recognize when we talk about these folks is that these are people who haven't been able to absorb nutrients from food for years, and they're often painfully underweight. Painfully. I mean, I've had men, five feet nine, five feet ten inches tall, who weighed 120 pounds. And so this is not a time to worry about where calories come from as long as we keep it in safe range. So that's why that's there. Um, small amounts of um, gluten-free pasta, a little bit of tofu, rice cakes. Um, salt is the only condiment. Water is the only beverage. Five to six meals a day. And you do this until you're having three to four well-formed bowel movements without blood a day. It usually takes four to six weeks at the outside. And uh, the, we have letters we give to them to take back to their gastroenterologist to take them off the drugs and that sort of thing. And the GI docs are great. Um, they're really great about it. They understand. We have a referenced booklet that they can take too so the GI doc can see all the research. And uh, generally speaking, they're really cooperative. Absolutely no dairy, no high gluten foods like barley, rye, oats, and wheat. No oil, no raw vegetables, no supplements, no juice, no refined foods, no beans, no grains, no condiments other than salt. Nothing else to drink except water. And they all say, well, can I have this? And I ha can I have that? I said, if it's not on this list over here, you don't get it. And you're going to be very happy with Dr. Pam in four to six weeks, very unhappy the first few weeks, thinking if I have to eat another cup of brown rice and another sweet potato, I'm going to throw myself off a bridge. But trust me, you're going to thank me in a little bit because it works. All right. Um, and then, of course, we tell them to eliminate any food that causes a reaction uh, immediately. So once we get them stable, the next thing is to start a low-dose probiotic. And then once they're stable on that phase one diet and a low-dose probiotic, we start introducing uh, new foods until we get them to the place where they're stable. Um, they, um, uh, maintenance is no barley, rye, oats, or wheat, brow foods, no dairy. They have to be low-fat. And, um, and, and really can't have a lot of junk food. These are people that have, uh, have, have some difficulty and they stay on probiotics for the rest of their life. And um, so where's the evidence to support this? Again, I could show you hundreds of these types of studies, but you, know, you look at a study with patients who ate an unrefined high fiber carbohydrate diet, 10 patients uh, assigned to exclude foods to which they were intolerant. Um, and what you see is the exclusion diet resulted in more patients getting better. But the reason is because, and this is where a lot of people get frustrated, they adopt a plant-based diet when they have Crohn's or colitis, but they continue to have symptoms. And one of the reasons is because if you continue to eat those brow foods and you don't use probiotics and you don't stop the inflammation and all that sort of thing, the simple conversion to a plant-based diet will not work. It has to be phased in in this very specific way. But the point is that the exclusion diet was very, very effective. 
Um, 33 patients with Crohn's, 29 identified food intolerances, and 21 of them remained in remission for 15.2 months. And by the way, 16 years of remission, which is our longest, um, when you're dealing with drugs, you're lucky. I mean, it, people are ecstatic when a drug places people in remission for you know, a few years, a couple years, five years maybe, and we're talking 16. Uh, oh, and the most common uh, intolerances, dairy and wheat, okay? Um, 32 patients with Crohn's, placed on an unrefined high-fiber uh, high carbohydrate diet, followed for 4.4 years, compared with 32 match controls, the diet group, 111 days in the hospital versus 533 for the controls, one surgery in the diet group, five in the controls. Again, we start to see those really stark differences that you see, uh, and, and these people weren't on our diet. These were peop people just on better diet, okay? We don't see 111 days in the hospital versus 553. We see zero days in the hospital and zero surgeries, all right? Uh, relapse rates for UC patients are highest in patients who, um, let me step down a little bit, who ate more meat, protein, consumed the most alcohol. Fat reduction is really beneficial for Crohn's patients. Uh, one study showed that low-fat diet resulted in significant reduction um, in the amount of, uh, of water and sodium excreted with bowel movements. 10 out of 13 patients began having solid bowel movements. And again, these people aren't eating our diet. They're just eating a better diet. Think what happens with an optimal diet. Um, again, we see studies here, here. You see how many are listed? Studies showing that gluten restriction works. So I'd love it if somebody would do an Esselstyn study on IBD, but we don't have to wait for that. That's the point. And you guys come up with any disease, any disease you want, and we start looking in the medical literature, and I promise you, you will find this type of data for acne, for arthritis, for osteoarthritis, for migraine headaches, for diabetic neuropathy. Pick a disease, you see the same thing. We have enough research. Exclusion diets that involve excluding gluten and dairy, same thing. Dairy, frequency of bowel movements, status of health, decreases um, or increases, increasing numbers of bowel movements, status of health decreases with dairy. Um, Diet versus drugs, the diet works better. And remember, they weren't using a diet like mine. Probiotics, uh, evidence shows probiotics help Crohn's and colitis patients. Uh, so in other words, and, I, and I'm showing you a smattering. I mean, really, we would have to be here until Monday for me to go through a fraction of the stuff we could talk about. I mean, we could spend the next two hours talking just about probiotics and Crohn's and colitis, but, but the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to know that this is not something I dreamed about one night, you know, and, and woke up and said, let's try this. This isn't some type of storytelling going on. There's a lot of evidence to document every little thing I showed you, the reason why we use certain foods, the reason why we introduce foods in a certain order, the reason why we introduce probiotics at a specific point in time, we have research to show that. Now, I am going to have to step down here to read this. This is a woman who allowed me to use her name. Um, this is before dietary intervention. And she says, quote, even though I was on medication for Crohn's disease, I still had frequent symptoms at 30 years of age. This disease seemed to have take over my taken over my life. I found myself not doing things I once enjoyed. My life revolved around the restroom. When I went somewhere with my kids, they would see one and tell me where it was in case I needed it. I stopped making plans with friends. As a single parent, I was afraid of losing my job because all of the frequent restroom trips I was having to make. And I just took two paragraphs from her story. But this is a few weeks after. Weeks, not years. Living my life now has become more worry-free. I can make plans with friends and family and go places with my kids. It's nice to not worry about where the closest restroom is or even if I'll make it on time. A great example of change, I used to love riding on the back of my friend's motorcycle, but when the Crohn's took over my life, I was afraid to ride anymore. I even sold all my riding clothes because I thought I would never be able to ride again. But now I date somebody who rides and I'm always going on trips with him. Crohn's disease no longer controls my life. Now that particular person adopted this diet in 2012, still symptom-free in remission. And that's what we see time and time again. You do not get this with drugs. You do not get this response with drugs. So the bottom line, and I wanted to make sure we left some time for questions, which we'll take next, but the, cost, cost, or the cause of most common degenerative diseases is diet. An optimal diet's the best way to prevent, stop, reverse disease. 
The medical journals contain thousands of articles. You just have to have enough curiosity to look for them. And, you know, I get a lot of t interns in my office. I'm blessed with interns um, these days. They come from Europe. They come from all over. I had a woman from Berlin with us for four months this year, medical students, dietetic students, nurses. And when they come in, um, it's an experience. They always say at the end, I've had never had any experience like this. But I always tell them, if you're going to be a good clinician, whatever specialty, you're going to be a medical doctor, dietitian, whatever, if you're going to be a good clinician, it's going to be because you develop something called the curiosity gene, where you start tracking down information, you start getting geeked up about finding this stuff. And, and what we see with interns, the first couple of weeks they're there, they act like they've been inducted into slavery. They sit at the computer. Of course, we feed everybody really well at my office, but you can just see it's sort of like drudgery till you get the hang of it. And then invariably what happens, and, and you can see their faces light up. I just had one in the office the other day who had really struggled with this, and he said, I think I know what you mean now. I said, what do you mean? He says, I start digging into this material. I don't want to eat. I don't want to go to the bathroom. I want to cancel dinner with my friends. All I want to do is I just want to sit here and find more stuff. I said, you are going to be a great doctor because you have the curiosity gene. That's the key to all this. So it's all there. And yes, I, I think we need to do more research. I think there's always room for more research and there's so much stuff we don't know. So I hope at some point in time I'll be able to participate in helping to make that happen, particularly on Crohn's and colitis, which are my areas of interest. But there is so much there. There is absolutely no reason for a doctor to avoid putting somebody on a plant-based diet because they think, not enough research yet. We have enough.